We're continuing this teaching series, The Spirit-Led Life, so it's uh, so good to have you with us, and I'm, I'm glad that we're going to be able to go through this very important message this evening. You know, when you think about the Spirit-Led Life, it's so important to be guided by the truth, the truth of God's Word, the truth of His will, and the truth of what He desires for our life. Since God desires that we would be led by His Spirit in our decisions, in our choices, in just every, about every area and corner of our life, it's so important that we're operating from a position of truth. Therefore, it would be totally counterproductive in our journey with God to be guided and led by lies. Because a lying spirit cannot coexist with the Holy Spirit. They're on two opposite sides of the spectrum. And so this evening, we're going to be talking about a very important area. It's actually found in Scripture a couple of places, but the idea and the teaching of lying to the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's very important, and it's extremely relevant for us today, especially for this teaching series. If we're going to be led by God's Spirit, we're going to be Spirit-led, then the last thing we want to be do, the last thing we want to do is to be caught in some web of lies. And I like to think of lies in three areas, and you'll notice them in your outline. First, take it back all the way to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 to 6, we pick up the account of Eve being tempted by Satan himself. And you know how that story goes. The devil goes and he tempts Eve to take part of the apple after God told her she shouldn't. And this is what it says starting in verse 3. But God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent, that being the devil, said to the woman, you will not surely die. So there's a lie right there. It all started with that. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And by the way, he ate too. It all started with a lie. And when it comes down to it, if we're going to wind up being caught in a lie, it all starts with this. You want to write this down. It's very important. It starts by believing a lie. You know, there are three types of lies, this web of deception, if you will. First, it starts with believing a lie. You know, believe a lie. That, that is an area that we can get ourselves into, and that's exactly what ha happened here with Eve. The devil approached her, and he contradicted what God said, and he started out with a lie. After all, he is the father of lies. That's on his business card. That's how the Apostle John describes him through Jesus, that he is the father of lies. And so it all starts in our lives with believing a lie. Now, how that's relevant to us today, thousands of years later, some 7,000 years later from, from this, is that when you study scriptures, it's almost as if some of these things are written in the morning, you know, when you wake up. They're so relevant. Well, we believe lies sometimes, don't we? We believe lies about our appearance. We, we believe lies about our assurances, especially when it comes to God. Oh, God can't possibly love me this much. Or God, he forgot me. That's what, I'm going through all this stuff, so God forgot me. Or God's getting even with me. He's keeping score and all these different things. And we can even begin to believe those lies that are planted in our head and our mind. And no wonder it pushes us far from the cross. Remember, the number one strategy from the beginning of time is to cast doubt is to cast a lie in your mind to get you as far away from the things of God as possible. In fact, all of us, we all have different testimonies we could share this evening, but all of us, somewhere in the, the middle of that, we'd have a testimony of, well, I was staying away from God because, you know. It all gets back, we were believing some type of lie whether it was God didn't exist, or the Scripture's not true, or God, you know, God couldn't possibly love me, or I had all this, I didn't need that, we were believing that lie. It all goes back to a lie. It all goes back here to Genesis 3. Uh, the, the problem with the evil world is a lie. You know, I would go as far to say, our world is so corrupt in our world leaders that if every dignitary and world leader and king decided to tell the truth, the world would probably fall apart, the economy or something, you know, or, or trade. There's probably so many under-the-table deals that we, you know, the American people are so unaware of. 
there's been so much dishonesty, but God desires truth. And truth is so important when it comes to the Spirit-led life. So it starts with believing a lie. Of course, we know what Moses told us in the Ten Commandments, that thou shalt what? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear forth witness. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. God was very clear on that, that we're not to bear false witness. And when I think of bearing false witness, obviously, verbally, that's the most common way to lie. You can verbally lie. But you can also slander somebody's name behind their back. That is lying. You know, life is hard enough. You don't need somebody, you know, throwing stones at your character when you're not looking and bashing you to family and friends and so forth and on. So you can slander. You could gossip about somebody, which is another form of slander. You could also give nonverbal signs. Hey, you know that guy, Ray? Yeah. You just verbally communicated something about me by, by shrugging your shoulders and going, yeah, that guy. You know, right there, that's communicated something, and that could be approaching bearing false witness about somebody. And so it's very important. Let me give you another area of false witness, flattery. Scripture talks about that. When you flatter somebody, not because you're trying to encourage them, but because you're going to try to manipulate them, that's a form of lying. And you know, guys did all the time, oh, baby, 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 this, that, and the other thing, you know. That's a form of lying. And so we could believe a lie, and secondly, you might want to write this down, we could tell a lie. We could tell a lie. And both of these areas are, are important to zero in on and get it right. We don't want to believe lies. We don't want to tell lies. But I'll tell you something we definitely don't want to do, which is totally, totally the polar opposite of the Spirit-led life. Write this third one down. You don't want to live a lie. That's the last thing you want to do. You do not want to live a lie. I don't want to live a lie. Because that, that, that is so far from the thing that God wants for us that you couldn't, even, you couldn't even measure something up against it. The last thing God wants you to do is live some lie, to be somebody else or be something else and not be true to Him. And this evening, we're going to look at an account in Acts chapter 5. And it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira, these two characters in the Bible who were a part of the first church, who uh, undoubtedly were believers in Christ, but they were caught up in believing the lie that they had to elevate their status by falsifying records of a property sold. And they were so caught up on being acknowledged by the church of Jerusalem that in the process, the apostle Peter tells us in verse 3 of chapter 5, it says it here, that they lied to the Holy Spirit. And we're going to get into detail about that story. But when you consider that we could believe a lie, we could tell a lie, and, and even more dangerous, we could actually live a lie. And what I mean by living a lie is we could be caught up in something that's grieving God and we shouldn't be doing it, but we're going to keep doing it. And we've bought the lie that it's all about our own happiness or it's all about our own satisfaction. Well, God has so much more for you than that. So the last thing you want to do is just settle. You know, we could be believing the lie this evening that we're nothing and we're not going to make it. And, when it, and we can get into all these different areas. At the end of the day, lies are from the pits of hell. Let me remind you of that. Let me say that again. Lies are from the pits of hell. It's important you understand where they come from. And God is the opposite of that. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so the Spirit-led life is the opposite of falsehood. It's the opposite of lying. And so when we get caught up in believing a lie, telling a lie, and more seriously living a lie, there are consequences to that. And some of those consequences happen without us even knowing. Other people see them. Take notice of these consequences that I've written down here in your outline. There's five of them, and there's probably plenty more, but we, we only have so much time to get this evening. First, when you and I are, are living a lie or telling a lie or believing a lie, it increases our stress. Now, we don't need any help in that area, right? The stress just comes every day you wake up, there's new stresses. Bills, family, relationships. I mean, right at the top, those are just three areas right there, and we just keep going. We don't need any help in stress. But when we lie, we are throwing the wood on the fire for stress. Because what happens? You tell one lie, you got to cover it up with another and then another. And it gets stressful to, to know, you know, does this person know? Does that know? And what if this person sees me? And we get caught up in that game of trying to cover ourselves 
And nobody likes to look bad. We love to cover our backside. We love to cover our back. We don't want anybody to see who we really are. And so it could get very stressful to cover us up, myself included. And so when we're lying, telling a lie, believing a lie, or living a lie, it increases our stress level tenfold, and we don't need that. Secondly, it causes us to be more insecure. Insecurity. We get insecure. All of a sudden, we think everybody's talking about us, but they're really not. They got better things to do. They don't care about you and me. You know, they're, you know we think everybody's against us. We, and we, we develop this kind of victim mentality, sweeping the nation right now in certain parts, thanks to certain things that are in law these days. You know, we create all this insecurity. You know, lies will do that. Lies manufacture insecurity, and we need to be careful with that. Another area to look at is irritability. We become irritable. All of a sudden, things that maybe would just roll off our shoulders, you know, we're rough around the edges now. We have short answers, and we raise our voice, and we don't talk to people anymore, really. You know, we're irritable. Well, it's because there's, there's lies somewhere that's going on right now in our heart. And we got to deal with it. Now, again, listen, you coming here tonight, let me just be honest with you. You don't have to do anything. I mean, you can just come here and you're polite because you're a nice person and you, hopefully you won't fall asleep. You know, you come to church on Sundays at 11 to 6, that could be some of the best sleep you'll ever get. Okay? I saw one guy, he was nodding out the other day. I, I think I'm going to put a sign up. Come, if you're having trouble sleeping, just come here. You know, I'll put you to sleep for an hour, okay? So listen, you don't got to listen. You can tune me out. You can, you know, the seats don't recline, thank God. Or we really be in trouble. They're very comfortable. The fact of the matter is, is that you can tune it all out right now. We can be honest that there could be some areas of our heart that we're lying to God about. And that's totally counterproductive to living a spirit-led life. We get irritable when we're lying or when we're living a lie or we're believing a lie. I don't care who you are, I don't care how many halos you have in the closet, that's a fact of life. And then here's one of my favorite words, you could become an ignoramus, an ignoramus. That's just another way for saying you could become very ignorant, ignorant of other people's needs, ignorant of what's going on around you. And then let me just share this with you from personal experience, as I shared at the first service, I'm a member of the sinful club, just like you are. I have a card just like you do, okay? The truth of the matter is, is that when we are living a lie or believing a lie or telling a lie, we can even become ignorant to the things of God, ignorant to what He desires for us. Oh, I don't need God. And there's, there's two areas of that. There's the person that thinks, I don't need God. I'm ignorant. I don't need to do what He says. You know, that stuff, that's not relevant today. And we become ignorant to God's sovereignty and His authority. And we try to usurp God. And we come up for reasons why we need to do what we're doing. What we're doing is, is we're trying to rationalize our lives. Then the other area, there are folks who become ignorant, they think they know it all. They think they don't say it like they think they know more than God. You know, they can even be in a, a Bible teaching church that's teaching the Scriptures, and they want to, they want to tell folks who have uh, expertise in the area, they don't, no, no, that's not what God means. I could do this and I could do that. And I always tell people, would you rather me lie to you? Would you, would, would you rather that? Would you rather me, would, the, would you rather the counsel that comes from 168 New Dorp Lane be this? Do whatever the heck you want, as long as you give money. Well, how could he say that? Well, that's what it would be, come down to. It's more than that. Our desire is what God's desire is for the people that come and fashion these doors on Sundays and through the week, that we would... Uh, live in obedience to who God is and walk according to His commands. And sometimes there needs to be a little heart surgery that takes place. And we can become ignorant to those areas. But I want to share with you today, if there are any lies that you're believing on about your salvation, about your walk with God, oh, about, oh, I'll never get out of this, and, and you've been labeled, everybody's labeled you. Everything from, you know, the top professionals, the family, you're this and you're that, and maybe you've started to believe those labels. But those labels are really lies, and you need to know what God says about you. And you don't want to become ignorant. You want to become cold to the things of God. In fact, I'm so thankful that my identity is not wrapped in who I used to be. My identity is wrapped in Christ, is wrapped in the cross and the victory of the empty tomb. And I want to grow cold to that because that's my bread and butter, and that's your bread and butter. And then the last one that I want to tell you about is one that's very real is instant discipline. And none of us like to talk about the D word. I know growing up I didn't like that if my folks had to, you know, rain down some, uh, some new rules on me because I was, you know, breaking some uh, rules of the home. Instant discipline. 
And I like to think of it again as a father or mother. What loving parent, if they saw their child making a train wreck of their life, wouldn't bring the reins in? I mean, just think about that for a second. What loving parent? Oh, you know what? Hey, do what you want. Hey, you want to mess up your life even more? Go ahead. Hey, you want to go get, go, go do jail time here? Go do that. You know, you want to go screw up the rest of your life? Please. No, no parent, loving parent would do that. I mean, so much so that your child may dislike you. They might even tell you they hate you because you're trying to rein them in because you love them. And God is the same way. And in what we're going to read this evening, which was it, again, the book of Acts, unprecedented times, I believe this was preserved for us as an example. I'm thankful what we're going to read is not the norm because the church would be empty of what we're about to read. God was giving instant discipline as a reminder of how much he loves us and what needs to be done and how living a lie, well, that's, that's, that's settling. God doesn't want you to live a lie. He wants you to walk in truth. Now, I want you to understand why this is so important we're, we're about to go through. See, the truth is powerful. You may not realize this, but it is. Jesus said this, you shall know the truth and what? The truth shall what? Set you free. Not maybe it'll set you free. Well, hopefully it'll set you free, but you're a loser. No. You shall know the truth, and the Scripture says, out of the mouth of Christ, the truth shall set you free. The truth of God has the power to transform your mind, transform your heart, and transform your life. It's already transformed our destiny, hopefully, if we believed in Christ. Truth, God's truth is the most powerful force on the earth, His Word. And you know what? Lots of other things come and go. Lots of styles come and go, religions come and go, but God's Word is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. In fact, Isaiah declared the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever. And I know some of us right here, you may never, you may never break through in this life. I want you to just, you know, listen, you've got to hold on and keep on keeping on and know that our citizenship is not here. It's in the life to come. For those of you who are suffering and holding on today, the fact of the matter is, is God has so much more for us, and He wants us to safeguard our life with truth, and I want to share with you about that again through Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1 of that chapter. Now, as you find your place there in your Scripture, the context is such. The church of Jerusalem, we're going to spend a few minutes in this text now. The church of Jerusalem has flourished greatly. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's walked the earth for 40 days. He's ascended to the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Peter... John, and of course the half-brother of Lord James, they are basically the upper echelon of the leadership of the church along with the other living disciples. And they are experiencing tremendous growth in Christ, but not without persecution. See, the devil tried to persecute the church. He tried to attack the church by causing Peter and John to be captured by the religious leaders have them uh, have a beaten thrown to them, throw them in jail, whatever he had to do. But guess what that did? That backfired in his face, and the church exploded even more. Thousands more got saved and baptized. And you notice that all around the world, in different parts of the world. See, nobody threatens our freedom to come here. Did anybody get threatened on the way in? No, you don't even got to worry about parking on Sunday. Nobody threatened you. In other parts of the world, I would be shot for giving a sermon. You would be thrown in jail for listening to this heretic that's opposing aggressive Islam or other teachings of the world. And so we have to realize that we live in a different world here in America in Staten Island. And in those days, they were being challenged as well. But every time the church is persecuted around the world and throughout history in the book of Acts, guess what happens? The church grows. And guess what happens every time you're persecuted when you're tempted to lie and you say no to it and you follow Christ, guess what happens to you? You grow. You know that? Every time you say no to the devil and yes to God and you, you keep on keep it on, you don't buy the lie, you don't live the lie, guess what happens? You grow. And there's numbers of ways that we grow, but spiritual growth has nothing to do with age. It has everything to do with standing your ground in Christ. And so... The book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, we're going to pull up on this very important story, and we read here about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. 
who, what's, we're going to read about is they have a piece of property and they're going to sell it and they're going to bring money to the apostles in the church of Jerusalem and they're going to say that they're giving everything from the proceeds of the property, but really what they did was they gave some and they kept the rest. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. We're going to find out that Peter says, nobody even asked you to give anything here. The problem was, was that they were trying to be somebody they weren't. They were trying to live a lie because at the end of Acts chapter 4, there's a character by the name of Barnabas who means son of encouragement, who went on to be a tremendous servant of God. His name always listed second or third. He had no problem being, uh, you know, behind the scenes. He was an encourager. Barnabas had done something very similar, and obviously accolades go with that, I, I suppose, and they wanted to be like Barnabas. They wanted to try to steal that thunder. And so they fabricated this lie about the sale of property. And it wasn't so much about the property. Some people like to manipulate this passage into a money passage. Has, let me just tell you, has nothing to do with money. Has everything to do with the heart. Has nothing to do with dollar signs. It has everything to do with telling the truth. And we're going to find out here that Peter is annoyed. Peter, you know, the rock. Peter's flabbergasted. He's angry. Just listen to this exchange, starting in verse 1 of chapter 5. But a man named Ananias. Now, you want to circle the word but right away. Why? Because that is in contrast to the end of chapter 4. But. Here's Barnabas, given out of his heart, no lies, all truth, doing it pure joy, the joy of the Lord, the give, and all that good stuff. Hallelujah, praise God, everything else you want to say. But. And you don't want to be but after, Anna, after Barnabas. That's not a good thing to be right now. Because that means you're in opposition to that type of life and heart. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge, so she's in on it, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, Peter's going to tell us in just a moment. But what possessed them to do this? They're both in on it. Well, because again, they saw the accolades and the prestige and perhaps the, the notice and now the responsibilities that Bar, uh, uh, Barnabas is getting here and, and um, Barnabas is getting and they want that. Pride is at the issue, is at the heart here. Pride is the problem here. Their pride is causing them to go blind spiritually. Pride is very dangerous. And you know what the Scripture says? Pride cometh before the fall. And I don't doubt that these two people are believers. They're in the church of Jerusalem. God has blessed the church. I think that's why Peter was so angry, because they're witnessing these amazing things. Perhaps they were eyewitnesses to Jesus walking the earth after he defeated death on the third day. What are you thinking? Well, pride got in the way. And so you might want to write this first principle down if you are either stuck in a lie or if you want to prevent yourself from falling into a lie. Don't go, not me. Oh, it never happened to me. Be careful. You're close. Closer than you think. So you might want to write this down. Release pride to avoid great pitfalls. Release pride. You've got to release it up to God. Doesn't mean you're a wimp. Again, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is your power under God's strength. Moses, considered the meekest man on earth. Remember that? Moses. Moses, who, who look, look at the confidence he had. He walked right up to Pharaoh and told him who, who, who was boss. God. John the Baptist, considered the most humble man as we read the New Testament. And then Jesus commented on his life. There's been nobody born greater than him. And so being humble is not a position of weakness. On the contrary, release pride to avoid great pitfalls. You don't want to fall into a pit. As you study the language of pride cometh before the fall, it's not, well, I just tripped. You know, I fell. Let me get back up. Every once in a while, I'll do that. Thank God, you know, for my old football playing days and stuff. Um, I know it don't look like it, but, but I, I, you know, I can hold my own. I, I can, you know, I can trip sometimes, but I always I catch myself. You know what I mean? And then I get back to my confidence again. You know, that's not what this means. Pride cometh before the fall. A fall, as you study that understanding, is basically falling into a ditch, falling into a pit. 
when we are prideful and we snub our nose at God, uh, we got to be careful because we could fall into a pit. And if you want to safeguard yourself from going backwards, if you're in a lie right now and you got to get out of that pit, you got to release your pride to God. That's the only way to get out of the pit. That's the only way to avoid the pit. Just so you know. Don't believe a lie. That is the only way to go. You got to release it. Now, Jesus said something similar to this. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, what was he talking about here? What does poor in spirit mean? Well, that's just for the poor people. No, God loves poor people, rich people, middle class, everybody. Don't, that nothing to do with money. Blessed are the poor in spirit means blessed are those who are poor in their own pride. Blessed are those who are willing to admit that they are spiritually bankrupt apart from Christ. This was his opening sermon, the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you're going to be my follower, step number one, you've got to release your pride. If you're going to follow me, you've got to release your pride. And we need that. It's the only way out of the pit. It's the only way to avoid the pit. And we don't want to be like Ananias and Sapphira. We don't want to be the but after Acts chapter 4. That's the last thing we want to do. Now, the story goes on to say this in verse 3. Now, it gets a little serious now. But Peter then said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? And you might want to put a marker right there. Look at that. Peter right away. Again, this, this isn't just Joe Blow talking right here, okay? This is Peter, the Apostle Peter, a main voice of authority in the early church. Peter speaking and saying, he already, he's diagnosed it, he's identified it. Why has Satan filled your heart? Now, what do we like to do when we're caught up in something? We like to do what? We like to blame. We blame shift. Well, this one, this one, and that one. Peter's identified it right away. You're believing a lie. Satan has filled your heart. And tonight, perhaps you're believing lies about yourself. You're not good enough. You, you don't have salvation. It's never going to get this. It's never going to get that. You're ne and, and Satan just continues continuing to pound on you. And he loves to pound on you. He loves to pound on me. And Ananias and Sapphira, you know, they thought they probably were all this in a bag of potato chips, but they left themselves vulnerable. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? Notice to who? To the Holy Spirit. Give light to the Holy Spirit, Ananias. And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You know, Peter's asking questions here. He's dumbfounded. What in the world were you thinking, Ananias? Why are you playing this game? Look what God is doing in this church. He's, he's exploded this church. People are being healed. People are being saved. There's thousands of people here. We're living in, again, the book of Acts is amazing because there are these incredible things going on. It says that everybody sold everything they had, even though they didn't have to do that. It's not commanded, but they were doing it anyway because the church had exploded. Everybody was in town for Pentecost when Christ then was raised from the dead. And, you know, the, the population in Jerusalem had swelled to two million people. So certainly those who got saved, they wanted to be where the apostles of Jesus were teaching. And so the church had this amazing population boom. People were stepping up and helping and contributing. And that's why Peter's so dumbfounded. That's why, you know, humanly speaking, he's, you know, I think there's a human component to this. He's so angry over this. These are in emphatic statements as you study it in the Greek language. And Peter's saying, you know, basically, what in the world are you doing here? After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Uh, Peter's saying, it was your money. Why are you lying about it? You didn't have to give it to the church. Nobody asked you to do that. Ananias, what's going on here? Peter is questioning him, trying to, to get an answer here. I'm getting so angry, I, almost lost, I lost my place in the Bible. Let me get back here. And so why is it that you have... Contrive this deed in your heart. You have not lied to man, but you have lied to who? God. Notice here at sidebar, Peter has no problem. Jehovah's Witnesses don't like this, by the way. He, Je, Peter has no problem saying that he lied to the Holy Spirit, then a few, few verses later saying he lied to God. Peter has no problem connecting the Holy Trinity. No problem at all. Again, a main voice of authority in the early church. So Peter, Peter's flabbergasted over all of this. And then after this happened, it says, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and he breathed his last. He died. And great fear came upon all who heard it. I bet it did. 
Peter spoke to him. What did Ananias die from? Food poison? No. Caught a heart attack. As Peter was sharing this, Peter didn't do it to him. God did it. God took him. You know, a lot of times people go, we got to get back to the days of the book of Acts. Shh, don't say that. You'd have to start an undertaker's ministry. Be carrying everybody out, myself included. You know, these were unprecedented times. Oh, how could God do that? See, he is that vicious God they told me about in the book of Exodus. How could he? Listen, the, God calls us home for various reasons. We know that we're allotted just so many days here on this earth. That David said, King David said, teach me to number my days. And sometimes God calls us home because he has jobs for us to do in heaven. I firmly believe that. Sometimes we're so sick and God says, enough of this. I'm going to give you a new life in heaven. We're suffering physically, mentally, whatever it may be. And God says, enough of this. I'm calling you home to paradise. I think when we get older and our body starts breaking down. Again, I've told you my theology about getting older. The reason why you break down and you kind of get a little uglier and things start to drip and say all that type of stuff, even though people try to fight it, because God is slowly detaching you from this life and preparing you for the next. You know, Jen's grandparents, two sweet people in their 80s, you know, they, they moved, they recently moved to a new apartment. They moved across the street from a cemetery. And my grandfather-in-law said to me, he goes, look, look, we're, now, now we're close to over there now. So at peace with it. Why? You know, there's just a peace that comes over, over you when your faith is in things that are not of this world and your life has run its course. You know, it's, sometimes it's hard to think of when you're, you, when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s, but as you get older and you, you start getting down those, those years of 80s and 90s, you begin to get detached from this life. That wasn't the case here, though. They were getting in the way, and God had to remove them. He loved them. He removed them because they were getting in the way. And we see that also in the book of Corinthians where Paul says some have fallen asleep. Now, they went to heaven. They're in heaven now. Um, I bet there's a line to talk to them when you get there, okay? Maybe get a fast pass or something like that to talk to them and say, what in the world? You know, they, you won't condemn them, don't worry, you know, because it's heaven. There'll be no judging. But the fact of the matter is, is that God removed them as an example to the church. And Ananias caught a heart attack and he died. This brings to mind what it says in the book of wisdom, Proverbs 12, 19. It says, truthful words stand the test of time. But lies are soon exposed. Remember that. Lies are soon exposed. So what is God telling us here through this example of Ananias so far in Proverbs 12, 19? Write this principle down. Refuse to play the hypocrite for small is its reward. Refuse to play the hypocrite for small is its reward. The last thing you want to do is settle for being a hypocrite. As I've shared with you before, depending on how big your torso is, a pat on the back is about 18 inches from a kick in the pants. And if all we're settling for is one of these in life, to get noticed and a pat on the back, we're settling. And God might, I don't, listen, I don't think God, I don't think everybody can catch a heart attack tonight. That's not what we're saying. But it's, it just shows how God was saying that we need to refuse to play the hypocrite. It goes on in verse 7, it says this, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Now, could I just add an insight here? This church, they weren't perfect, but they were so close to it that nobody gossiped in three hours. Okay, imagine that. <coughs> this terrible thing happens, and nobody's even talking about it. You know, imagine if that was today, we talk about everybody. What people wear, their home life, and their wife, this, that. Well, people talk about everybody in church today. They throw it out with the bathwater. They don't give anybody a fair shake. They, they actually make people want to forget about it, jumping off the bridge. They drive them there. And here, you know, nobody knows. This is amazing. I mean, this just really speaks of the integrity of this church. That three, not, not three minutes, three hours has passed. And nobody even knows what's going, nobody, no word hasn't gotten to the wife. Nobody's gossiping here. Just a side note to take notice of how much we must be careful with our lips. We must guard our lips. We must guard people's lives. You don't know what somebody's going through behind their doors or what's going on in their heart and the pain that they feel. Don't, let's never add to people's misery because they've got enough going on. 
And yet people might need to get it right, but we don't need to go around telling everybody's life story, and we don't need to go tell people uh, uh, how it ought to be. We got to help love people and show them how it could be in Christ. Big difference. And this church had it right. Well, verse 8 says, and Peter said to her, tell me whether you, and he's talking now to Sapphira, he's extending an opportunity to her. Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. So Peter was giving her a chance to come clean, but she didn't do it. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed <coughs> together to test the Spirit of the Lord? What is wrong with you, Peter says? What's going on here? He, he, Peter is dumbfounded by this. He's just, as he's boiling over here. Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they're here to carry you out too. And you might want to write this down. When you're in the pit, or to avoid the pit that comes after the pride, receive God's olive branch by addressing stupidity. Somebody said to me on the way out today, help me address my stupidity. Because that's what the, as you look at the context here, that's what Peter must be thinking. It's almost like you see Peter, this is lunacy. Why are you lying to the Spirit of the Lord like this? Look what he's done. Look what he's done for you. Why are you settling? <coughs> and God took her as well. He wanted to extend the olive branch, but she passed it. And God extends an olive branch to us, even this evening, for us to address the stupidity in our life. Do you want to keep believing a lie? You want to keep telling a lie? You want to keep living a lie? Or do you want to take God's branch and grab it? I say the latter, grab it. Grab his olive branch. Address the stupidity in our lives. I'm not saying God's going to hit you with lightning. He might give you a case of diarrhea. I don't know. Case of the hiccups. I don't know. I, I'm not into that stuff. I can't get into that. I'm not going to tell you what God's going to do. He's not going to do. I'm not going to get outside the scripture. But what I will say is he loves you so much and he wants you to accept his olive branch. You know, you know the heart of God by looking at the scriptures. It said this in Luke 19. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. I haven't come to condemn the world. I've come to save the world. He's come to save the world by offering an olive branch of peace to draw us in, to get it right with him. Number four, point number four, write this down. Respond as God did with instant purging. Purging is just a fancy way for saying remove. Now God instantly took care of the issue here. And I think this passage is to illustrate the following. Not that God's going to hit people with heart attacks, but that God wants us to instantly remove the stupidity in our lives. He doesn't want us to procrastinate. He doesn't want us to blame this one, that one, and this person, and it's happened because, no. He wants us to instantly, just as he did, deal with what needs to be dealt with in our life. And you have the power to do that because the cross is empty and the tomb is empty. By his blood... There could be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. He's died for your lies. He's died for my lies. And we need to respond as God did instantly. Stop putting it off. You know, it's like not fixing a leak in the roof. All of a sudden, then the roof caves in. Some of you uh, men and women who work on homes and are contractors or what are laborers, you understand that. You don't fix a problem and it metastasizes. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It gets out of control. That's the last thing you want to do. That's what a lie does. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And you don't want to do that. All those consequences we mentioned before, respond immediately. Verse 10 says this, immediately she fell to her feet, his feet, and she breathed her last. And when the young men, get the young men here, get the young men to do it. We don't want the, old, the older folk doing it. We're the older men. Let's put them to work. They were, they were on their, uh, their iPhones and iPads playing video games. So when the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband, God acted immediately, and we need to act immediately. What are we struggling with today? What lies are we believing? God has so much more for us. We need to purge that which does not belong there. You know, there's a story 
In first, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 34, we learn about a certain king named Josiah. You may have heard of him before. And King Josiah is written about in the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles. And this is what it says in verse 34, uh, uh, chapter 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. That's not a misprint. He was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 31 years, we're told, in Jerusalem. He's the grandson of Hezekiah, by the way. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, notice. And he walked in the ways of David, his father. He says, of the lineage of David. And he did not turn to the right or to the left. He stayed on course, in other words. For in, eight, for in the eighth year of his reign, now he's 16, while he was yet a boy, notice it says he began to seek God. You're never too young to start to seek God. Imagine that. He was 16 years of age. You're also never too old. Moses didn't get kicking with his great leadership until he was 80. He never too young. Eight years old, became king. Moses, 80 in his leadership. You're never too young and you're never too old. Don't believe any lies. So he's 16 when he begins to seek God. And then in the, the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. So now he's 20. Four more years have passed. And he's purging Judah and Jerusalem and the high places of Assyrium and the carved metal images and they chopped down the altars of the Baals. What is going on here? There was a lot of idolatry worship going on. King Josiah under his reign said, we want none of it. And he starts to purge it. He starts to remove it. And as he's removing it, we find out a few verses later, they found the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. That's what you call it, the Pentateuch or the Torah. In all their idolatry worship, the people of Israel lost the Bible. Imagine that. They lost sight of the truth of God, and that's what happens to us when we believe a lie. It happened here. History repeats itself, doesn't it? Well, King Josiah, he purges, he removes it, and he starts with Assyrium, the goddess of fertility. And he removes all the statues. I would love to show you a picture of her, but it would be inappropriate to put up in church. And they worshiped. And they grinded it down. They spread the ashes as over the burial places of her once false worshipers. And then he went to the spots where they worship Baal. Baal, the goddess who was, the god who was supposed to control rain and thunder. You remember the showdown that God had with that belief? Remember Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18? Elijah went to King Ahab and said, you know what, enough of this Baal worship. This is what God told Elijah to say. What a hero he was. He said this. He said, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. You want to say that, that this false god controls the rain? Guess what? It's drought time, baby. Can't go in the pool. You can't water the lawns. Guess what? It's a drought. Call 311. Complain all you want to. It's a drought. They also said that the God, this God of Baal, this false God, he can rain down lightning. Well, then guess what happened? After King Ahab said to that Elijah was a troublemaker, they had a little showdown at Mount Carmel. And 450 prophets of Baal, the false God Baal came. And Elijah came. And they said, Okay, you false prophets of Baal, why don't you call down for lightning? And if your God is real, well, he's going to bring down the lightning. Well, guess what? It started in the morning by 12 o'clock. Elijah had his arms folded against the rock, and he actually mocked them. He cracked a joke. He said, and I'm putting it in a Ray translation, okay? He said, well, maybe your God is in the bathroom right now. Maybe shout a little louder. And that went on and on. As the story goes on a little bit later, then Elijah calls on God, and instantly God sends down lightning and fire. That's so much so that the people were in awe, and they said, the Lord is the God. They, they exclaimed it twice. And God defeated the thoughts of Baal. So when King Josiah was removing that, he was purging it. He was responding to what needed to happen, and we need to do the same, my friends. And so write this last principle down. Based on this, the fact that we got to purge, what do you need to remove this evening in your heart that doesn't need to be there? Again, look at the last three weeks together. John spoke on clinching the Spirit. Last week, we discussed grieving the Spirit. Tonight, 
lying to the Spirit. They all go together, these, these, especially these last three. Whatever is quenching the Spirit, whatever is grieving the Spirit of God is a lie. And guess what? God is extending an olive branch for you to get it right. No judgment. No condemnation. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God might take us out of the way if we can't get it right and say we're getting in the way of his plan and take us home to heaven. We're not going to lose heaven. But God says there's an easier way because I already did it for you on the cross. Look to the cross. Stop settling. Stop settling for mediocrity. So you might want to write this last principle down. Run from mediocrity to receive God's best. Run from it. Stop running to it. Because at best, a lie, even though at first it could look good and feel good and smell good and all that type of stuff, <coughs> at best, a lie at best is mediocre compared to what God has for you. Run from it so you can receive God's best. In fact, that's probably a good thing for you to write down somewhere on your outline. What is God's best in everything you do? What is God's best in this relationship? What is God's best for my response? What is God's best for my purity? What is God's best for my finances? What is God's best? And that needs to be the heartbeat of your life. Because God wants you to bless you more than you want yourself to be blessed. Because he wants to bless you the right way. There's a lot more to this life than happiness. Happiness is short term. Happiness could be, oh, my hair looks good, and then the wind blows. Hair don't look good anymore. Got a new shirt, you get a stain. Not so happy anymore. But joy is something that you can even have in the hospital. The joy of the Lord. Joy is something you can have even on the doorstep of death because you know God is coming for you. May not be too happy right now, but your joy is in Christ because your joy is in something far more than the circumstances of this world. Verse 11 says, And great fear came upon the whole church and all who heard these things. God was saying, don't settle for mediocrity anymore. I got so much more for you. I want to close with a story. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were able to get blessed with some giant tickets, and I took Joseph to see the giant game. And we had a great time. He was playing with kids in the parking lot, you know, the tailgate. You know, everyone's had one big happy family over there. All the giant fans were hanging out, sharing things and whatnot. It was a great time. And um, even, even as I drove up, you know, I parked my car. This one guy, he was looking all hard like he owned the whole parking lot. You know, like he looked like he was ready to you know, do a few rounds with me. And, and, and 15 minutes later, he was sitting in the trunk of my car hanging out talking with me, sharing some things. It, it was just amazing how God was, was moving. Well, I took Joseph when it was time to go to the game, and we started to go up the escalator, and boy, we just kept going. I, I thought we were going to heaven. We were going so high. You know, we just kept going. I thought I was going to see Moses in a few minutes. At one point, I thought, I thought maybe we must have died in a car crash, and this is the way as you get up to heaven. Probably, get, you know, we're on our way up there now. Okay, we're, you know, we knew we were saved, you know, and I guess here we go. This is, you know, here we go. We get up to the, you know, the, the top concourse there, and, we, you know, we get, we're getting ready to get settled. But on the way up there, the most beautiful thing happened for me as a dad, and, and you parents know this feeling. You know, it, the game started at 7. That was kickoff. So we were, uh, you know, we were making our way up the escalator. So it had to be about 6.40 after all the hanging out in the parking lot stuff. And, you know, the sun was set at such, such a position that it was just kind of coming in. It wasn't hurting your eyes. And here was Joseph's face. And he had such a face of excitement, a smile of happiness. Also like, where are we going? You know, been on this escalator for a while. But, but just wonder, excitement as a father. I was so thrilled to see that look on his face. And some of you parents know you have moments like that with your children that you could think back. And you know what? There's no amount of money. There's nothing you trade those moments in. And guess what? Nobody could ever take them from you. They're yours. They're gifts from God. And I had that moment where I saw his face, and it just brought so much joy to my heart because he was so happy. And I was thinking later on, that's how God is with us. When we're happy and joyful for the right things, there's nothing more that God takes pleasure in. When he sees his children 
completely caught up in the moment of life or satisfied with, with <coughs> thankfulness or excitement or happiness. That that is the essence of, of true worship. When we're living that way and we're so delighted, we're so content in that moment. <coughs> Regardless. What kind of father would I be if Joseph later on in life as he gets, you know, he's a pastor's kid by the way, and he's Italian, so I'm really in trouble. And he's, got a, he's got a strong will. You know, he had, a, he had a fight. He almost died at birth, as some of you know. And so he's got all three things going, the Italian thing, the pastor's kid thing, and he's got a strong will, Jen and I in trouble. Well, guess what? What kind of parent would I be if my son, when he got older, was doing things he shouldn't, and he was taking pleasure in that? What kind of parent would I be if I didn't just stop him, at least have a talk with him and encourage him to take pleasure in the right things? I'd be a terrible parent. God is a loving parent, and he takes great joy when you and I focus on what matters most, and that's the cross, and that's his will for us. Great pleasure God takes in that when we set our eyes on Christ. And so I leave you with these scriptures from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Let this be a charge to your heart. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, the writer of Hebrews says, he just talked about the whole of faith, the whole of fame in Hebrews 11. <coughs> Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Get rid of the lies, in other words. And let us run, run for God's best. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Not the race of mediocrity, the race after God's best. And we do it this way. Listen to this, verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul said in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand. And we want to walk in those good works. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Don't believe the lies from the pits of hell. Misery loves company. And the devil would want nothing more than for you to run from the things of God. Run to the truth of God. Because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through Him. But don't worry. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. I've reserved the place for you there. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. My friends, I implore you today, if you've never accepted Christ, to put your hope in the truth. Put your hope in Him for what He's done on the cross that He rose from the dead. And if today you're struggling with some type of burden or some type of lie you're living, give it over to Him. Run from that mediocrity and receive God's best, the best of Christ. Let us pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank You that Your promises are true. You're the promise maker. Every promise You wrote about the birth of your son, all 300 plus of them you fulfilled. Every promise in the Old Testament written hundreds of years prior to the life of your son. Lord, the book of Isaiah found in its entirety in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Psalm 22, which talks about crucifixion. Lord, it's all there. Lord, I know that there are skeptics here tonight. But Lord, I pray that you'd speak to their heart. Of what, are their, what are they basing their belief system in? What are they willing to, to base eternal life on? Somebody else's version of religion or some lie? Lord, we thank you that your scriptures are true. We thank you that they have stood the test of time. Lord, we know that if we get off course and we follow the wrong things, even in Josiah's time, you, we can lose sight of your word. We can forget it altogether and lose it. We thank you, God, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. 
We thank you, God, that we can never lose our salvation. So great that promise is. And we pray, God, that we would not settle to live a lie, but we would live in the power of the resurrection. Because we trust in all our heart that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we surrender our lives over to you this evening. Thank you, O oh God, that you accept us just as we are. Lord, I pray for every single person that's here today, myself included, O oh God, that the next time we're tempted, Lord, the very next time, maybe tonight, God, that we would be confronted with that question in your spirit. What is your best? God, we ask you for strength to live, O oh God. We thank you for this example. God, we want to run after you, the author and perfecter of our faith. We commit our hearts before you this evening. And so these prayers, in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.